The federal government outlines their multi-step gun control plan. I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. Whenever the topic of guns come up, things typically get a little bit heated. It's a heavily polarized subject, but for this conversation, let's try to keep our heads on our shoulders and remain logical because we're going to be reviewing some facts and the current government's plan on how they want to tackle gun violence. I'm going to try and be as objective as possible here. But first, before we get into that, let's begin by setting the playing field a little bit. The first thing I want to make clear is that I don't subscribe to the idea that citizens should be armed, or even that we deserve guns as a right, something akin to the American Second Amendment. I'm actually against that idea. For me, when I weigh the pros and the cons of gun ownership, it seems to me that there is more bad than good. I recognize the good, but I think when you stack it against the bad, there is no comparison. If you've ever been in public near somebody with a gun visibly in their pocket or in their holster, you'll probably understand when I say that guns change the entire dynamic of many social situations. While armed, any tense encounter instantly becomes a life or death situation. Things can spiral out of control without you even willing it. Having a gun at your disposal gives you the means to wreak havoc based on emotion. It's the power to take away a life in such an easy fashion, and that shouldn't be bestowed upon just anybody. Here's a real life hypothetical situation that probably occurs more often than we would think. Two people get into an argument, they get into a disagreement, and they begin to quarrel. They get into a fight. In one hypothetical, let's say they are unarmed. Maybe it escalates to the point where they start fighting each other and one guy gets beaten up. They go to the hospital, whatever. The wounds are not going to be typically life-threatening. But if you present that same situation and arm both people way earlier in the progression, you might get to a point where you feel threatened so you pull out your gun, even without the intent to shoot the other person, maybe as a means of intimidation. This is always possible in any escalation now. Then, if we assume that owning a gun is a right in this hypothetical world, the other person likely has one too, and now they pull their gun out on you as a means of defense. Now you're in a gridlock. You didn't intend on shooting the other person, you wanted to scare them, but now they have a gun pointed at you. The tensions rise again. Now you're worried that you might get shot. So your finger starts to quiver a little bit, you get a little bit nervous, and maybe one of you pulls the trigger without even wanting to kill the other person particularly. You simply are just scared, you're emotional, and things have spiraled far out of control. The playing field is very different when people are armed. That's the reality of the world right now, and I don't think it's a good thing. The plain fact is that society just is not at a place where we can maturely handle having the responsibility of owning a gun especially when everyone has one and you can carry them around in public. Emotions are far too high right now, polarization is far too high as well, and people are just likely to do something stupid. That's been the case for all of human existence. Maybe one day, when we reach a sentient level, owning a gun and having one never produces an unintended consequence, but even in that situation, it begs the question why you even need the gun in the first place then. So right now, just based on the way that people are, I don't think it's a good idea to have each other armed like that. Guns in the wrong hands leads to some of the greatest tragedies ever witnessed. And let's say that even maybe you're not fighting somebody, but one day you are very emotional, you're down on your luck, or you're very angry. Somebody did something to wrong you. We've seen cases where people take that anger out on people who they are projecting their feelings on. Giving them a gun enables them to do something crazy. Even though it's a small fraction of the populace who are willing to do that, we don't want anyone to be enabled with those means, the means of terror, to just let your anger fester and one day you decide, I'm going to take this gun and get revenge. Or some people do it to become an icon or whatever the case is. We don't want that possibility available. Making guards, guns hard to come by in the first place is one mechanism that we use to mitigate those risks. Now, there are people on the pro-gun side of things who center their defense around the notion of guns are protection against a corrupt government. Now, they'll say that in the case of a government trying to indoctrinate the people or something akin to Hitler and the Nazis or even in Russia what happened with Stalin, the people being armed is a mechanism of intimidating the government and making them less likely to try and take you over, basically. 
an armed population is a good defense against tyranny, and there is some truth to that. Honestly, the concept is sound, but the real world tragedies of gun violence just don't equate to the hypothetical threat of a corrupt government taking you over and you being able to stop them with your handgun. Because here's a news flash, if a country that we live in does become corrupt to the point where we are fighting the government with our weapons, we are already lost because in Canada, the military will likely be able to squash us. Train soldiers against a civilian with a pistol, they're not going to do too well. And in America, it's probably even worse because they have the SEALs and highly specialized military forces who, with one soldier, can probably take out a dozen civilians even if they were both armed with the same weapon. So, although there is some merit to the point, I don't really buy it entirely. Now, I will say that if you are convinced that there is a high likelihood of your government turning on you and you feel like the best defense against that is to win a pistol, there probably is a little convincing someone like that because... They perceive the threat of government takeover to be greater than the threat of gun violence. And, and I really do feel like that's the case for most Americans who are pro-gun. They aren't simply pro-gun for frivolous reasons, but because they actually do fear the possibility of a corrupt government. But lucky in Canada, we don't have to deal with that right now. So in summary, I'm largely not in favor of readily deploying firearms among the populace. But having said that, Trudeau's current gun control plan is not a good one. According to the Globe and Mail, the federal government plans to implement its gun control strategy in a multi-step process, and the first thing that they really want to do is to act quickly to prohibit assault weapons, and they want to time, or have more time, to figure out their answer when it comes to other types of weapons. So, last election, the Liberals promised to get rid of assault weapons and allow cities to ban handguns at their own discretion. So, in other words, the federal government will handle the assault weapon aspect and implement that ban across Canada, but the individual cities can figure it out when it comes to handguns. I think that's largely backwards when we consider the threat level that is presented with these weapons. We can take a look at Stats Canada for the data on homicides. In 2014, guns accounted for 155 deaths. In 2018, that number ballooned to 249. That's a massive increase over a short span of time. It went up by 60%. So obviously, there's an issue here, but let's look a little bit deeper into that. In 2018, of the 249 deaths, 143 of them were caused by handguns. That is 57% of all deaths by firearm, and that's actually identical to the entirety of homicides by firearm in 2014 from all sources. In 2018, that number was covered by just handguns. Then, when you look at the fully automatic weapons, they produced two deaths in 2014 and two deaths in 2018. They peaked at six in both 2015 and 2014. These fully automatic weapons are what I assume the government's talking about when they say military-style assault weapons. Obviously not handguns, that doesn't fit into the picture. Now, after handguns, the next most popular category of choice for homicide perpetrators is rifles and shotguns which accounted for 34 deaths in 2014 and 56 in 2018. That's a big discrepancy between number one and number two and then you have the automatic weapons after that. The facts are rather clear in that regard. Handguns are the largest concern right now when it comes to gun violence and that is with a period. These handguns are easy to conceal, they are easy to transport and they account for over half of all firearm deaths in Canada. Now, I should also make clear that assault weapons are largely unnecessary for the vast majority of people to own. Why do you even need one of those? They're military style for a reason. The military is where they belong. And I don't see why government shouldn't curb that to some degree. But when we talk about gun violence as a whole, as a problem, the solution to ceasing the largest amount of deaths does not lie with the assault rifles at this point in time. It's just a fact that handguns are the greatest threat statistically. Then, this begs another question about whose handguns in particular have the problem. Is it the legal ones or the illegal ones, or maybe it's a mix of both? So Bill Blair, who is the Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime Reduction, he doesn't appear to have this figured out yet. He suggests that implementing a buyback program across Canada for these assault weapons is a good idea. In total, the budget to get that done for the buyback is estimated at a cost of $250 million 
and critics are actually saying that number is a low estimate given the market value of some of those weapons. This is where more criticism jumps up at the plan. So we know that gun violence is a growing issue, but assault weapons are not the largest group responsible for the casualties here. It's handguns. In fact, things like fully automatic firearms make up a minuscule portion of the pie. Then, if you are going to dedicate over $250 million towards that, is it really an effective strategy? People are enraged because it feels like money is better spent elsewhere. For example, the growing opioid crisis comes to mind. According to the Government of Canada, since 2016, there have been more than 9,000 opioid-related deaths and 94% of them are accidental. That means people didn't want to die when they were consuming the opioids. And sometimes you don't even know that you're doing that. That's a massive issue and that needs a solution. Purely in terms of scale, more Canadians are dying via opioids than assault weapons or even handgun homicides in general. So another idea is hospitals. They are underfunded and they could use some form of money, some form of investment. Also infrastructure, it's falling apart across Canada. If you are tackling gun violence, you got to get the most bang for your buck at the very least and I don't think this plan does that. Then, Dale Blair goes on to say something quite silly. He says that we are very mindful that we are dealing with law-abiding Canadians and want to make sure they are treated fairly and respectfully. Hello? <laughs> what are you saying? By definition, a law-abiding Canadian is not your problem. That's obviously the wrong group of people. If someone isn't breaking the law, that is, that they are law-abiding, that means they are not killing people with their guns. It means that they are responsible. You are wasting your resources on them because they are not the problem when it comes to gun violence, the fact is, illegal guns are the largest threat. Criminals with those guns are the threat, not the law-abiding citizens. Now, you might be able to make the claim that maybe one day these law-abiding citizens become the criminals, but right now we do know there are criminals. There's a hierarchy of value here, and we're starting at the wrong place. There's a very obvious threat that we want to neutralize, but these guys are playing around the bushes and attacking things from an odd angle. What they seem to misunderstand here is that criminals are unlikely to partake in your buyback program because they need their guns. The old man with a gun on his shelf for display is more likely to consider that payout because his livelihood isn't compromised. If you are in a gang, if you commit violence as a means of making money, you need your gun. Stopping the inflow of illegal guns from across the border seems like a more worthwhile initiative to me. Now, to be fair, Blair does mention that, but it's not the focus of his plan, and it's not the first step. He is focusing on these assault weapons and the buyback program. This next part here is some of the few lines he says that actually make sense. He adds that they want tougher penalties for those who smuggle guns into Canada, and that's good. Also on top of that, they want to stop the flow of handguns from legal sources that are being diverted into the hands of a criminal. That's good as well, but it appears to me that's the more central issue, and they're looking past it. They're tackling the wrong source first, and this is just the side piece to that. It truly feels like the government is caught up in some hysteria right now, and they are not thinking clearly or logically about guns in general. They are emotionally hijacked, in other words. We can easily recognize that gun violence is a growing issue in Canada, based on these statistics, but the government is seemingly investing large sums of money in an area that is set to have little impact on the issue as a whole. Buying back military assault weapons is not going to have a tremendous effect on these figures based on the current trends. We know where the issues are. Handguns are the biggest problem, and further, I'd argue, it's illegal handguns in the hands of criminals. Then, we have the question of priority. Do we have to focus on this assault weapon ban right now, or is the money better invested in other things like the hospitals, like the infrastructure, like the opiate problem? What is the basis for answering that question? If we are trying to produce the greatest utility for Canada. Simply based on a victim standpoint, the opioid crisis is far greater a threat than these gun issues. Then, if we're going to think about it from helping the most Canadians who are not victimized yet, well, having a hospital be better funded to serve more people is a good idea. In lots of parts of Canada, people are struggling to get seen in an adequate amount of time. Putting $250 million into a buyback program for assault weapons which are a fraction of the gun issue as a whole, is not the best use of our money by any sense of the imagination. There is no criteria, 
where this is an adequate approach to the problem. The only way it makes sense to you is if you are under the impression that assault weapons are the most heinous thing in the world. But a simple look at these stats paints a different picture. Given that, I'm not entirely blaming Blair or Trudeau though, because there is some logic to why they think these, these things. If you take a military style assault weapon, the amount of damage you can do with that versus a handgun, there's a big difference there. The assault weapon probably has a larger magazine, it's probably more effective, you can do more damage with it and whatnot. So if somebody is trying to commit an act of mass murder, go into a mall or a school or do something crazy like that, they will probably prefer to have the assault weapon versus the handgun. But we know from a number standpoint that the occurrence of that is rather slim. With the handguns though, it's a tremendous amount of the violent homicides that are being perpetrated with them. So based on emotion, yes, you see the assault rifle and you know it's a weapon of mass destruction and it's very bad, but the reality is they are seldom used. Then you see the handgun, something that is smaller, more compact, you know it's limited in terms of the scope. A smaller magazine, maybe less damage coming out of them because they're smaller and whatnot, but we do know because of that, because of their ease of access, their concealability, just how people are underestimating them, those are the weapon of choice for homicide committers and they account for over 50% of gun violence in Canada. That is where the real issue is and they seem to think that tackling the legal owners is going to help the problem. It's pretty clear to me that the criminals who attain the firearms illegally are the real problem. A law-abiding citizen by definition is not causing you any issues with their guns because they are abiding by the law to not kill people. That was a major slip up and I'm not too sure what they're thinking by saying that. By saying that they know that their plan is going to affect these law-abiding citizens. You want to affect the criminals who are committing the homicides, not the people who are responsible with the weapons and they are following the law. Now one day you might say the goal is to get rid of all guns from society where nobody owns a gun, but this is a multi-step process as they've laid out. The first step should not be at the bottom of the pyramid trying to get rid of the guns from the legal households. There are larger threats to take care of. The handguns in the hands of criminals who are using them to commit homicides. It's such an easy equation, but they seem to not grasp at that. They're caught up in a hysteria given some of the unfortunate circumstances surrounding guns around the world and they're trying to act on something that might not need to be acted on right now. It's a massive chunk of money being spent on the issue and I would argue it's not effective in terms of scope. And if this is step one, I can only hope that step two isn't as backwards or as ill-conceived because if that's the case as well, we can look back on this as a major waste of Canadian taxpayer dollars. So that now brings me to the end of today's conversation. If you enjoy the content, be sure to leave a review and share that'll help us grow. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Perry Platform. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you soon.